morning. Welcome to Reformed Presbyterian Church this morning, the first Sunday of September. Welcome all of those who are watching on Zoom. I suppose since it's a holiday weekend, quite a few people are probably away this weekend, so we welcome you on Zoom and welcome all of you here in person. Being the first Sunday of the month at RPC, that means a couple of things. First of all, we'll celebrate the Lord's, Sab the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, the Lord's Supper, together is Lord's Sable, that's why I screwed that up like that. Uh, the Lord's Supper we'll celebrate later in the service, and also it means we'll be doing Amen Bingo today. So children, if you're interested, you can go to the back bookcase there, get an Amen Bingo sheet, and fill that out throughout the service, and Miss Alicia Weaver will give you a prize at the end of the service. As we turn to our worship this morning, we'll begin with the exhortation from Psalm 47, which we'll read responsively together. From Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our king, sing praises. For God is the king. Sing praises with a song. Let's pray together. O oh Lord Most High, indeed we come this morning to gather together to worship you. Lord, may we sing loudly your praises, for there is much to praise this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please remain standing as we confess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe.
since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. seated. I want to welcome you all again to Reformed Presbyterian Church this morning. Again, I know many of you are probably watching online, being out of town for the holiday weekend. If you're visiting with us, whether online or in person, we're glad that you're here. Uh, we pray that you will be blessed by our worship and our worshiping together this morning. You, do, you will see a, a little slip in your bulletin, or if it fell out, it might be on the floor, or maybe your neighbor has it. Uh, if you want to fill that out, just some contact information and drop it in the plate in the back at the end of the service, we'll be happy to get in touch with you just to say hello uh, and answer any questions that you might have. If we turn now to the reading of Scripture this morning, you can turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. We'll be reading verses 5 through 13. This is the last sermon as we finish out our series on spiritual disciplines we've been going through for six or seven weeks now. And hopefully by this time you've sort of realized that many of these disciplines are interrelated. They're not isolated. You don't just kind of do one at a time. They tend to all kind of work together. It's kind of like the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. There's one fruit. There's not fruits of the Spirit. It's one fruit with different aspects to it. And you tend to grow together in all of those different aspects of the fruit of the Spirit. And likewise, with spiritual disciplines, they tend to happen together. They're interrelated. Bible intake fuels everything that we do. 
Stewardship undergirds many of the others, what we do with our time and resources. What is church for? What is my time for? What are my talents for? Worship, which is not one that we went over explicitly, but it's an overflow of all of these. The end goal is that we would worship God. Solitude and silence often ties together with prayer. It might also tie together with Bible intake, and so these disciplines tend to work together, to, to work together to focus us towards our worship of God. This morning we'll be focusing just on the aspect, the discipline of prayer, and we'll read Matthew 6 to get us started. And then like we've been doing throughout this series, we'll be bouncing around quite a bit different verses um, throughout. Let's begin with Matthew 6, verses 5 through 13. You'll see it in your bulletin as well as on the screen. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's appropriate the sermon on prayer that we begin with the word of prayer. O oh Lord our God, we ask now that you would attend to us this morning. May your spirit come and teach us what we need to be taught. May it change us where we need to be changed. May we be comforted where we need to be comforted. May we be challenged where we need to be challenged. But, O oh Lord our God, would you grow up us as individuals and as a church. Together, would you make us stronger, more mature in the faith, that we would reflect you more to the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to do the cliche thing this morning and give you a three-point sermon. Some of you will be happy with that. Three points, but each of those three points has four sub-points, <laughs> because I like symmetry. So three points. We'll talk about four characteristics of prayer, four practical helps for prayer, and four encouragements in prayer. Again, like all these spiritual disciplines, we aren't being exhaustive. This isn't all there is to say about prayer. We're trying to highlight a few aspects with an eye towards encouraging all of us to follow Jesus better through these different means. So four characteristics of prayer. And again, we'll go back to Matthew 6. The first characteristic is that prayer is expected. Prayer is expected. Look at the first phrase of verse 5 and verse 6 and verse 7. Verse 5, and when you pray. Verse 6, but when you pray. Verse 7, and when you pray. You notice it said when and not if. Because it's expected. Prayer is assumed. It's an assumed part of the Christian life. Jesus doesn't even give a command to pray. He doesn't even say, well, you should be praying, you know. And if you happen to be praying, here's how you should do it. No, he just assumes it. It's expected. So, when you pray, this is how you ought to pray. Prayer is an expected part of our lives. A second characteristic of prayer is that it is constant. It is constant. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. That's a lot of prayer. Now, is that hyperbole? Is he exaggerating? Perhaps so. But at the very least, what he's trying to communicate is you should be praying a lot. 
It's like when Peter asks, do I have to forgive seven times? And Jesus says, no, 77 times. I'm not trying to give him a formula. He's trying to say, look, you just need to forgive all the time. How often should I pray? Pray without ceasing. All the time. It should be a regular part of your life. That does not mean that you spend 24-7 in your prayer closet, going through sort of formal prayers. It can just mean living your life with a conscious presence of God. That there's a constant, regular, ongoing recognition of being in God's presence. And perhaps having an informal dialogue with him as you go throughout your day. Some of you may have read the book by Brother Lawrence, I think was a 17th century monk, called The Practice of the Presence of God. And there he says, he writes, There is needed neither art nor science for going to God, but only a heart resolutely determined to apply itself to nothing but him. That our focus should be solely on the Lord, or at least primarily on the Lord at all times. We've talked in previous weeks about being ambassadors for Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.20. If you're an ambassador, you're in constant communication with whomever sent you. Colossians 3.17 says, do everything in his name. A recognition that all that we are, every breath we're taking, we're doing in his name. And we're aware of that. And so we're constantly in some form of prayer, even if it's just an informal recognition of his presence. At the same time, yes, there's also moments when we should have devoted, undistracted times of prayer. Just like in a marriage or a family, you have times when you're just going about the business of running a family. You're just doing jobs, and you have kids, and there's chores, and there's errands, and there's so on and so forth. And you're constantly communicating with one another. Or at least constantly aware of the presence of your family and how it structures your life. But there also needs to be a time of devoted, undistracted communication with your family or your spouse. Dinnertime conversation, game nights, date nights. And you're doing nothing but communicating with one another. So prayer can be both of those things, but it needs to be expected and constant. And the third characteristic of prayer is that it is a privilege. We'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. It says this, For what great nation is there that has a God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us whenever we call upon him? What great nation has a God like we do, O Israel? O church, who has a God like we do? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is no one. There is no other God. Only our God, Yahweh, can hear and can act. All other so-called gods are dead and mute and worthless idols. So we have a particular and amazing privilege that we can actually go to the creator of the universe, the king of all kings, almighty God himself, the living God, the God who hears and sees and cares, even if at times he acts beyond our understanding. The world does not have a God to draw on. When times are bad, to whom do they turn? Or these days, who do they blame? When times are good, to whom do they give thanks? There's no response from the universe unless it's from the Lord God himself. We have the privilege of prayer and praise, and as we read earlier from Hebrews 4.16, let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have that confidence. Because what other nation has a God like our God? It's an incredible privilege. 1 Peter 2.9 says we are a royal priesthood. The priest in Israel, among other tasks, they were the ones that offered up the prayers. They went behind the curtain to the Holy of Holies and stood in the presence of God. But now, since Jesus has come, that 
that curtain has been torn in two. So that all God's people are a royal priesthood and can come before the throne of God in the name of Jesus, but come before him. Now this privilege also comes with a responsibility. All privileges do. We talked about freedom a few weeks ago, Galatians 5.13. What will you do with your freedom? And Galatians says you use your freedom to serve others. You have a freedom, you have a certain ability, you have a privilege that you can go before God and call upon him as a son calls upon a father. And that gives us a responsibility. In Jeremiah 29, Jeremiah is prophesying to the exiles in Babylon. And I'll start in verse 4. It says, Lust says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Remember, going to Babylon, bad thing. Being in Jerusalem, good thing. But they send, and this is their 70-year timeout. They're getting rebuked. Babylon's the bad place where the bad people are, the heathens, the pagans. So the Lord speaks to the exiles, and he says, rise up, revolt. No, he doesn't. He says, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. In other words, get on living your life. I know you're in exile. I know you'd rather be back in Jerusalem, but get on with your life. You're going to be here a while. And then in verse 7, he says, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare you will find your welfare. You might be familiar with the Hebrew word shalom. That's the word being used for welfare. Your task in Babylon, O Israel, is to seek the welfare of Babylon, that evil nation, and to pray for it. The analogy is to us as well. Philippians 3.20 tells us our citizenship is in heaven. We're not at home either. We're just as much in exile in this world as Israel was in Babylon. We might feel at home here at times, but this is not our home. We're in exile as well. We are waiting for a better place. We're waiting for our true home, a heavenly home. But God has us in this temporary home. Even if that temporary home means 100 years in the same place, it's temporary. God says, be all there. And pray for wherever your current earthly home is. Seek its welfare. Pray to the Lord on its behalf. You pray for its good, and you pray for your own good. Because your welfare, your shalom, your peace, your prosperity is tied up with the place you live. So prayer is expected, constant, a privilege that has a responsibility, and prayer is also learned. In Luke 11, Jesus was praying, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And so Jesus taught them. Sometimes we think prayer is just simply kind of an informal thing. It should be genuine. You should just be honest and pour out your heart. Some people don't like to be boxed in by a canned prayer. But it says here that prayer can be learned. It can be taught. Which means prayer can also be improved upon. Our prayer lives can be better. Our prayers can be better. We can learn to pray for things in God's will, as, as Matthew 6 tells us. The more we understand God's will, the better our prayers will be. We'll pray in his will. And this gets back to reading our Bibles more, to learn more about what God's will is. We can learn more how to hallow or revere or worship his name. So we can pray, hallowed be your name. We can learn more about our own sinfulness. Forgive our sins and our own needs. Give us our daily bread. And the more we know God the better we can pray. And the more we pray, the better we know God. 
It's like any relationship. Good communication makes good communication easier. And good communication makes great communication possible. So prayer is expected, constant, a privilege with a responsibility, and something that we can learn, learn to do better. So let me give you four helps for prayer. Again, we're going with fours because that's just the way I like to keep things nice and symmetrical. These are practical helps for us in our prayer lives, especially when we're stuck. And we've all been there, right, where we're just stuck. Can't seem to get going. So number one, use prayers that others have written. Just recite prayers. Again, some of us don't like doing that. Like, oh, that's not genuine. That's not me. It's someone. The Lord gave us the Lord's Prayer, and we recite it. We have it written down for our benefit. The Psalms. You can pray the Psalms. There's lots of prayers out there from the ancients of the faith to the Puritans to the present. Don't be afraid to find those prayer books and use them to help get you started. The best way to become a good writer is to do a lot of reading. The more you read, the more your writing improves. So just get used to how words work. Reading others' written prayers, praying others' written prayers can help us to tune our hearts, to give us insight as to what the saints who have gone before us have said to the Lord. They can help just get you started and help you find your own voice in your prayer life. Number two, you can write out your own prayers. I'll admit this was a practice I used to do a lot more and now do a lot less, and I'm going to try to reverse that trend. (laughs) But write out your prayers. It takes longer, of course. But putting words on paper or typing them onto a screen, it changes the dynamic of how we pray. It changes the way you think and express yourself. I challenge you to sit down and actually write out your prayers. What do you want to say to the Lord? It can be valuable also to reread your prayers from years gone by. I did this recently. I found some old prayers that I had written. Some of them were like, oh, that's pretty good. Some of them were like, ooh, I was in a weird place in life then. But it serves as sort of a journal, and they can show you the journey that you've been on and show how God's been faithful to you over the years. Write out your prayers. Third real practical thing is a format. Sometimes we get stuck not knowing where to start. I remember we were part of a a church plant, a a small PCA church in Lake Nona, Florida, before we moved to Pennsylvania. And one thing that we did in every service when we got to the pastoral prayer part of the service is that we would pray for the church, the community, and the world. We often have three different people pray each of those parts. And just gave us a format to work with. Someone would pray for the church, the needs of the church, whatever they might be. Someone would pray for the community, just the area in which we were. For us, it would be Ephrata or Lancaster County. And then pray for the world, whether a particular hot spot like Afghanistan or Haiti, or just for the people who are lost in the world and need the gospel. I find myself sometimes when I'm stuck, just thinking through church, community, world, church, community, world. It gives me some tracks to run on. Again, it's just something that gets you started when you're stuck. But all three of those uh, arenas or spheres are places that we are called to intercede for. And lastly, the fourth help is just silence and solitude. Now, Dwight preached on this several weeks ago. Jesus often withdrew to be by himself so that he could pray. There's an example there for us. Yes, you can pray anywhere at any time. And if you're going to pray without ceasing, you're going to have to pray anywhere at any time. But it's also good to set aside moments that are designated as prayer only. A lot of times it's helpful if you have a specific time or place of the day in which to do that. Early morning, before anyone else is up and the house is quiet, there with your glass of orange juice. For some of you, it's coffee, I know. 
Maybe it's a quiet walking path where you can focus. Maybe you jot down some prayers, requests on an index card and just carry it with you as you walk around. Have a designated time and place where you have some silence and solitude to devote to nothing other than communing with the Lord. So lastly, let me give you four encouragements in prayer. And the first and best encouragement is from Romans 8, verse 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. Sometimes we don't know what to pray for. We don't know what God's will is. We don't see the big picture of the kajillion things that God is doing in our lives right now and how he's orchestrating all of the events of our lives and others' lives together. We have no clue the vastness and the complexity of God's plan for us. But when we don't even know what to pray for, the Spirit intercedes for us. The Spirit knows better than we do what we need. Perhaps this is why some of our prayers go unanswered, at least from our human vantage point. We think we know what we need. The Spirit steps in and says, actually, what he really needs is something else. We prayed for success or healing the way we defined it. The Spirit knows we need something much more, and the Father answers accordingly. In Luke 11, 11, it says, What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? I was reading that this week, and I thought, you know, in my house, it's sort of the opposite of that. My son wants a pet. He wants a snake. It can be a ball python. It can be a milk snake. He doesn't care. He just wants a snake. But the father knows better what the son actually needs and honestly what the son will actually be able to take care of and handle. And so I give him a fish. So our house is the upside down, Luke 11, 11. Because I know what he needs. And besides, I know if I came home with a snake, my wife would probably kill me. And my mother would affirm her. We don't know what to pray. but The Spirit intercedes for us. And sometimes we know what to pray, but the words fail us. We just don't have the words. Sometimes the emotions are running so high, we're so angry, we're so joyous, we're so despairing, we just don't have the words that are adequate to express. But the Spirit knows. The Spirit can interpret our heart and bring it to the Father and tell the Father exactly what needs to be said. All we have to do is groan. It's like going to a loved one and crying on their shoulder because you don't have any more words to say. We don't need the words because the Spirit helps us. It's a great comfort to us, isn't it? But it gets even better than that. Because in Romans 8.34, just a few verses down, it says... Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us right now. At this moment, Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, interceding for you, for his people. At this moment, the Spirit goes to God the Father with our words and interprets them. Jesus goes to God the Father with his words on our behalf. And what do you think Jesus is saying to God the Father about you? This is Jesus who loves you. This is Jesus who, because he loves you so much, went to the cross for you. This is Jesus who purchased you with his own blood. 
Jesus who is preparing a place in heaven for you. Jesus has your back. Satan wants to accuse you to the Father, and Jesus says, don't even think about it. See the scars. That's paid for. Jesus wants the very best for you. And Jesus is interceding for you right now to God the Father. Our prayers do not fall flat. They don't bounce off the ceiling, even though it seems like it sometimes. We have a God who hears. We have a spirit who interprets. We have a savior who goes on our behalf. So don't be discouraged in your prayers. In studying, a study of spiritual discipline, sometimes it exposes our failures. It might discourage us, say, I'm no good at this. There's this book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life on Whitney. I was reading this last spring, kind of when I got the idea for this sermon series. I haven't looked at it in two months, but just sort of got the ball rolling in terms of, maybe this would be good for us as a church to go through. I remember going through this and reading some of these, about some of these disciplines and going, man, I'm not good at this one. Maybe the next one will be a little better. Get to the next one. Ooh, I'm really not good at that one. Let's just skip ahead a few chapters. And... I'm terrible at this. It can be really discouraging. But don't be discouraged. They're not meant to be a burden to you. These disciplines that Scripture commands of us, and Jesus sets an example for us, they're not meant to be a burden. Rather, it's like God saying, this is the good way. Walk in it. Here's what the good life is like. It's a life devoted to reading God's word and being good stewards. Prayer, evangelism, silence, solitude, worship. This is the good way. Walk in it. She and family went for a short hike yesterday. You gave someone hiking directions. You say, walk up this steep hill covered in rocks. And if that's all it is, you'd be like, what's the point of that? But in 30 minutes, you're going to get this incredible view of the Susquehanna River and the hillsides and valleys on a picture-perfect early fall day. That's what the spiritual disciplines are like. Don't just look at the rocks and the steep hill. Just keep hiking. They lead you somewhere. It's meant to give you more of the Lord, opening us up to greater freedom in Christ. It takes some resolve. It takes some discipline. It takes some hard work. But it's one that bears fruit. So just keep hiking. It's an encouragement, an exhortation, a vision for what we can be. I can tell you all about the view at the top. That might keep you motivated to keep hiking. In the same way, we need to have a vision for who the Lord is creating us to be. What will we be for eternity? What will we be when we're glorified and away from sin permanently? Let's have that vision in our mind. Who do we want to be? What do we want this church to be like in a year or five or ten or fifty? Or do you want to look back on your life and say, what was my walk with the Lord like? And that vision is what should encourage us to just keep hiking. Just keep moving. Third encouragement to us is don't be fake. Again, back in Matthew 6 where we started, we must not be like the hypocrites. They love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Don't be fake. It's easy to look good <laughs> and be terrible. Spiritual disciplines can mask self-righteousness in a sinful heart. The Pharisees were not genuine. They were just self-righteous. People can point to their, their acts of piety. Look at all the things I've done. Look at all the prayers I've prayed. All the sermons I've preached. All the Sunday school classes I've taught all the evangelism I've done, all the mission trips I've taken, 
just to puff themselves up and distract from their shortcomings. You can do all the spiritual disciplines you like and still be a total jerkhead. Worse than that, you could still be lost. You can fake faith. Don't fake spiritual disciplines. They will do you no good. You do it out of a love for the Lord, knowing what the Lord has done for you. And lastly, don't go it alone. Obviously, there are times for solitude, those you do alone. But most of these, most of the Christian life is lived in community. We talked about that all throughout Colossians as well. Most of us lived in community. Encourage one another. Not with guilt trips, but with words of truth. With words from the Bible. Not with pep talks, rah, 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 you can do this. But with reminders of the goodness of God. We're beginning a, a monthly prayer. This is the announcement part of the service. We're doing it a little bit early. We're beginning a monthly prayer meeting this month because we need it. Third Wednesdays of every month, beginning this month and ending when Jesus comes back. We'll gather together for 45 minutes just to pray together. In part to keep ourselves accountable, to encourage one another, to gather together. You can come and not say a word. Just come. And just come. It sounds awkward. Yeah, could be. Sounds boring. It's okay. We need more boring in our lives, don't we? I could go for a good, boring prayer meeting. That would be glorious. But we come and we pray together. We pray as a community. Lift up our voices together in encouraging one another. Gerhard Voss wrote this. He says, legalism lacks the supreme sense of worship. It obeys, but it does not adore. Our goal is not to create legalists, to do all the things on the church calendar, to check all the boxes in your weekly devotional life, your daily devotional life, and think that somehow that makes you right with God. No, that just makes you a legalist. It obeys, but does not adore. Our goal is to adore the Lord, to worship the Lord, that all of these spiritual disciplines that we've been talking about Encourage us to love the Lord more. And we grow in our desire for God and to grow in our faith by seeing him more clearly. May we as a church do just that. May we be encouraged to pursue the Lord both in our individual lives as well as a body of Christ. Now ask us to close in prayer together. It seemed appropriate. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together in unison as we wrap up. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. I'd like to invite the elders who will be helping to serve the Lord's Supper. They would come forward at this time and we'll sit in the front row here. We'll have two stations for receiving the Lord's Supper. Uh, I'll be on this side uh, with the bread and someone behind me with the cup. And on the other side, you'll have another uh, two elders with uh, the bread and the cup as well. Uh, you can come forward using these two central aisles. As you come forward to receive the bread, if you would just sort of make a bowl with your hands and we'll use the tongs to just hopefully drop it in there um, so we can keep things no touch. And then after you receive the cup, you can go back to your seats uh, using the wings here. There's little baskets on the side. You can just drop your cup in there um, as you go by. 
Last week we celebrated the sacrament of baptism. We had three baptisms here, literally right here, uh, which is just such a joyous occasion for us. And we love doing that. It, it's a reminder of us. It's a sacrament. It shows us uh, entrance into the community of God. As those three young ones are now part of God's family, God's covenant people. And this morning we celebrate the other sacrament, the Lord's Supper. It reminds us of our communion with God and with each other our communion with the community of God's people. And we partake of this together, not individually. We come and we feast upon the Lord. It reminds us of his broken body and his shed blood on our behalf. These are symbols, but we also truly believe that the Lord is here in our midst. That he really, truly nourishes us through the sacrament. We call it a means of grace. It's one of the means by which God blesses us. Really, truly blesses us spiritually. So the invitation is for any and all who have called upon Jesus as Lord to come forward, whether your faith be strong or weak this morning, whether the road has been rocky or smooth this week, come forward and be strengthened in your faith through the sacrament. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we're grateful for this table. We're grateful for what it reminds us of the death of Christ on our behalf, that we can be right with God and have fellowship with God and with one another as well. Strengthen us in the sacrament, Lord. We thank you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that the Lord Jesus was betrayed, took bread and he gave thanks and he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said this is my body which has been broken for you do this in remembrance of me in the same way after supper he took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant in my blood Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me.
Is there anyone that still needs to be served where they are seated? Pray to God. Oh Lord our God, we're thankful for this meal. And we look forward to the meal to come, the great wedding feast, when we are with the Lord, all of us gathered together on the throne of God, sharing a fellowship meal with the Lord Himself. Oh Lord, we yearn for that day. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Do our closing hymn in a minute. If you're looking for the number in the hymnal, it's not there because um, we we're doing a different tune. Uh, so the words will be on the screen for you. If you would like um, the deacon's offering, the love offering, the plate is up here on the main table. You can bring that during the song uh, or after the service, whichever is your preference. Uh, again, that goes, that's our monthly collection for the deacons to use for various ministry, mercy ministries in our church and in the community. So let's stand and sing our closing hymn together. now the benediction of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. I do want to encourage you to look carefully through your bulletin this week. We're kind of relaunching the season of ministry here as schools get back started. 
Um, next week, all of our Sunday schools begin. We'll be at full strength for the first time in 18 months. Uh, so next Sunday will be a, a big Sunday for us, all the way from nursery all through adults. We'll have Sunday school classes for everybody, so please take a look at that. Uh, next week's sort of a kickoff, and the week after that we'll get into our normal classes. Also this week, uh, choir is starting again for the first time in 18 months, so please take note of that as well. Um, and lastly, I just want to point out that your front cover of your bulletin this week was by Justin Horn, so thank you, Justin, for that. We appreciate that. We've been doing uh, kids' kids bulletin art for the past, I think, seven weeks or so. It's been nice to have the kids participate in that way, and we're all just, we all just enjoy seeing the colorful bulletin covers for the past couple of months. So we thank all the kids that have participated in that as well. You have a wonderful Lord's Day. May you all be blessed. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.